Aloha. I'm Tim Apicella, and this is Moving Hawaii Forward. Today's title is Everything You Wanted to Know About uh, Honolulu Traffic But Were Afraid to Ask. And with me today is Jay Fidel, our guest, and Transportation Observer is your official title for today. <laughs> Jay, thank you very much and welcome. Thank to, you, Tim. Nice to be here with yeah, you. I appreciate you coming. I'm glad you do this show. Thank you. Uh, we've, we've been reaching a lot of uh, difficult topics about traffic and transportation, and we're getting some pretty good answers, but we have a long way to go. So, Jay, you've been here for a long time. You've been down in Honolulu. You had your business down there in downtown CBD of Honolulu, and you've seen things change over the years, um, presumably more traffic. Can you describe how the impact of increased traffic has affected your life personally and that of your employees and, and just things in general? Well, a couple of thoughts on that. You know, back in the day, and we're talking about the early 70s, we would pile in a car at lunch, my law firm, just uh, three or four or five of us, and we'd ride to Kaimo Key for lunch. And we'd have plenty of time to spare to get back in an hour, you know, maybe an hour and a quarter. The firm wouldn't give us much more time than that. Uh, and we were able to do that nearly every day. We'd go somewhere distant from downtown for lunch. Try that now, Tim. Yeah. No way, Jose. <laughs> I mean, it's just a small metric, but, uh, you yeah. know, you can't get around. You'll get no. stuck in a traffic jam no matter what. And sometimes I call it a flash jam. A flash jam is, you know, you can't prepare against it. It happens all by itself. It happens for reasons nobody understands. And all of a sudden, bang, you're in the traffic yeah. jam. Was that from like 11 till 1? Or is it, no, it just be. used to be just any time during that? It could be any time. And, yeah. uh, you know, I used to, I used to think when uh, Mufi Hanneman was, you know, pushing for rail, uh, pushing is an understatement word, um, you know, that, that he was thinking about this. That he was thinking about me sitting in traffic with a flash jam, me smoking out of both ears, me wasting my time, hours, hours in a week, uh, and he was going to do something, but actually he did nothing about it. And the question is whether we are prepared as a community to do anything about it. You know? well, well, I'm glad you mentioned that because, you know, here we are, depending on what um, organization you look at to see how Honolulu is rated as far as the worst traffic, um, right now, you could look at uh, the Texas A&M Transportation Institute that puts us around 11. Uh, there's an index called the IN RICS. The 2015 puts Honolulu down at number 10 for the worst. Uh, U.S. Today puts uh, Honolulu down at sixth worst in the country. And TomTom Tom puts Honolulu at the third worst. So how did we get here? Um, well, I'll tell you. You know, that's the question is a good question. First, we have too many cars on an island. If you go to, what is it, Bermuda? You know, no cars. Motor scooters, bicycles, no cars. Um, now, I'm not saying we should do that here, but we should certainly limit the cars. We have, you know, something more than one car per capita, you know, in, who lives here. We have an enormous number of cars here. We keep selling them, and we don't, re we take care of them. We don't retire them. Um, so they're still all on the road, and the result is that everybody's driving one person in the car. Over the years, talk about a historical perspective, over the years there have been dozens of efforts to try to ameliorate that. But all been dropped. They don't exist anymore, really. What efforts do you think specifically? Oh, well, I mean, you know, the staggered work hours, yeah. the state was going to stagger work hours, the Fed was going to stagger work hours, they were going to have all these special lane arrangements. Didn't work. Um, they were going to incentivize, uh, you know, multiple passengers. I, 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 they, they might have that now for the, the fast lane, but I'm not sure it really works. Um, Linda Lingle had uh, an interesting idea that an overpass, I, that was going to cost too much money. Um, and, uh, you know, the HOV lane, the one that computerized uh, fares, the computerized, what do you call it, uh, highway charges, toll charges. Hot lanes, they call on them. The free, uh, hot yeah. lanes uh, on, the, on the freeway. Um, you know, that, that would have been good, but we're not going to do that. Yeah. I don't see any We're going to talk about that a little bit later in the show because yeah, um, good. a lot of cities are starting to look at that very thing. Yeah, and well. I'm using, using the computer, using modern technology. Yeah. <clears throat> so what you have is too many cars on the road, and the roads haven't kept up. We haven't rebuilt the infrastructure. Some of our roads really need to be, you know, this one traffic circle up in, uh, on Kamoku Street in the whole state, one traffic circle in Europe, there's traffic circles everywhere, and right. it helps. Why? Because you don't sit there doing nothing waiting for a light. 
Now, there's other high-tech ways to deal with that, you know, like you could censor the cross-traffic. And if there is no cross-traffic, well, change the light. Yeah. Let's sit there for three minutes while the traffic stacks, stacks up. Uh, Panos Prevaduros had dozens of ideas, and we did some shows with him where we go from intersection to intersection, which is what you got to do. You know, it's one by one. You stand there, you analyze it, you act like a traffic engineer, and you say, well, we're going to fix this intersection this way and this intersection that way. And he had lots of ideas, but nobody adopted yeah. it because I guess that was in the Mufi day. Mufi didn't want to, in my opinion, didn't want to fix the traffic. He wanted everybody to figure that the rail was going to solve the traffic, right. which is a ridiculous well, conclusion. That's, a, that's that silver bullet approach, and we know that a silver bullet approach does not work. And rail seems we to be... We all know that. Politicians but why do we rely on it if we Well, I, I think it. it was, you know, it's, it's, it's sexy to say it, it's sexy to believe it, but it's, it's not reality. It's that silver buckshot approach that actually is going to be part of the solution to our transportation problems. But let's look at, let's look at the, um, the front end of all of this. You're talking about officially trying to move cars in and out of intersections, or there's just too many SOVs and it's taking up too much space on the roadway. But how are those cars getting there? Um, let's, let's look at land planning. Let's look at land. Well, look at the television. Look at the television. Every three minutes, there's a car ad. Yeah. You know, and the culture, of, when I arrived in, in this place, which was uh, September 1965, I, I, I couldn't believe it. You know, I came from New York. They had checker cabs. You could buy a checker cab for like $2,000, cheap. And uh, Neil Abercrombie had a checker cab. That's right. <laughs> that was his thing. Anyway, you, you arrived here, and it's not a checker cab. It's not a small car. It's not a foreign car. I mean, even Volkswagen yeah. or anything else. No, it's a, it's a huge, you know, fin tail yeah, Cadillac. Yeah, like a 1956 Cadillac. Chev. Cadillac. Yeah. And you're sitting there in a Cadillac, and I say, Really, this is totally inefficient. Why are we doing this? Well, because Hawaii had and has and will continue to have a love affair with cars. They do. Everybody loves cars. Yeah. They want to have as many cars as they can. Some people have three cars, you know, or four. It's unbelievable. They have it, and we do not do anything to restrict it. That is not a constitutional issue. We could restrict the number of cars per family, per household, per registrant. But, but we don't do that. Yeah. Bottom line is it's too many cars. The cars are increasing, not decreasing. The roads are static and they're not being fixed or redesigned in any way. The intersections are not being fixed or redesigned in any way. So it's glut. And, you know, no surprise that we are one of the worst congested areas in the country because we don't do anything about it. We are not keeping up. Well, not only do we not do anything about it, we make the problem worse. And let me throw a couple numbers out here. You're looking at uh, development on Everplane. Now, the idea as well, we'll build all these homes out here and they'll all go to work down in Kapolei, right? That's the thinking. That's the theory. Well, we know that's not true. People are buying out in Everplane and they're saying, I still need to come in the downtown, Honolulu, because that's where my employer is. Yes, it's more affordable for me to buy, you know, the American dream out on Everplane mm -hmm. versus in Manoa or something like that. So it's that urban sp you know, it's suburban sprawl at its worst. And then we compound it by the following. Uh, Coa Ridge, approved now for 3,500 homes. Um, I might get the pronunciation on this, pronunciation on this wrong. Uh, Hupapili? Hupapili. Hupapili. 11,750 homes between Eva and Kapolei. Now, we're converting vital, precious, AG land, we're going to pave it over and we're putting houses on it. The infrastructure of these roads, is there no way it's going to have no, that kind of volume? But, the, but they got the permits. How did they get the permits? Well, the developer said, oh, we're going to create 7,500 jobs in Kapolei and they won't need their cars. And if those people who do need their cars to go into um, downtown Honolulu, well, guess what? They'll take that rail. Well, this is, this is false thinking. Mm. One, the rail's not going to be there mm. in time. And number two is that, you know, they're, they're calculating a percentage of people that are going to take that rail, which may or may not work at all. Mm. I doubt it will work. So why are we encouraging the conversion of precious AG land? And we're, you know, it's the old build it and they will come. So the rail's been a mechanism for the developers to develop land they couldn't previously develop because it was AG land. But now... It's an opportunity for them, and it's working quite well. So now where you have this suburban sprawl, it's going from the east side, and it's now affecting anything between Eva and Honolulu. It's not any different than L.A. 
or Washington, D.C., or Seattle, um, San Francisco, where you're out and these, you know, you've been pushed out, and people still need to come in. There's no guarantee that people are going to find employment in Kapolei and not need their vehicle. So I think that's really getting to the root of this problem. And as long as there's available land, AG land, to you know, pave over and, and develop, we're going to see it get worse, worse, and worse. Now, you know, the population projections here, uh, in by the year 2020, just for Oahu alone, we're looking at 67,000 people. Who made that projection? This is state projections. Yeah. Uh, 2025, we're looking at 94,000. Right now, we. Um, we have about 976,000 people here in Oahu, 1.4 in the state, million. So you add another 95,000 people by the year 2025, where are they going to go? Well, they're probably going to go out and they have a plain area. Um, well, some, you know, some structural mistakes, huge structural mistakes here. However it got started, this notion of a second city was flawed and is flawed. That's the first thing. The second thing, I mean, uh, you know, Neil Abercrombie, in the middle of a rail project that, that began in, you know, in Kapolei, instead of beginning downtown, it should have begun in downtown. That would have been really much, much smarter. Don't know why they did that. Maybe Movie thought that, you know, that he would have less political opposition if he started out where nobody lived mm -hmm. instead of starting where people live. But that was wrong. That was wrong. And look, the price we're going to pay. Anyway, Neil said, Neil Abercrombie said, we got to build up, okay? Because we have a population that, you know, exceeds our, our space. Forget about existing housing, it just exceeds our space. And I think that's right. So we're building up in a place where there is no transportation, okay? And we're building in Kakaako. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, and we're building out flat, you know, in a place that's, that's, that's got to come in. Right. So both of those are kind of mistakes. We should be building up. Yeah, in, a, in the city core. If you, if you look, this is not really, well, I guess it's all connected. You know, transportation is connected to everything. <clears throat> if you look at the Commonwealth, the English Commonwealth, the British Commonwealth, you know, in Canada, the classical city has a core downtown. It has a residential belt of, um, you know, going up kind of buildings. It has a, a, a green belt, and then it has a single family belt. Beyond that, it's reserve. The city is very organized in concentric circles. Come to find, that model is in a lot of Commonwealth countries, in New Zealand, in Australia. Um, you know, Adelaide, for example, looks a lot like Calgary, Alberta. Yeah. <clears throat> and this is a very good thing. And somehow the, the British, you know, bureaucracy, whatever it was, at the time this culture was being developed in the Commonwealth, they did the right thing. We have done the wrong thing. And the problem is you can't fix it. <clears throat> you know, any, any building has a useful life of at least hundreds of years, maybe, you know, many hundreds of years. Condo's a long time. Yeah. <clears throat> so, you know, what we, what we needed to do was build up in the center, that's what you do, and then build flat, you know, in concentric circles, and then mo move the transportation in, so to connect everything up. I don't think we did that. The second city was really, yeah. that's not going to happen. I want to talk true. about Kakaka when we come back from this commercial <clears throat> break, but yeah. um, we're going to take a break. I'm Tim Apicella. I'm here with Jay Fidel, and we're talking about transportation issues, tra traffic questions. And we'll be right back. This is Hawaii Moving Forward. Be right back. Thanks. Aloha. How you doing? I'm Gordo the Tech Czar here on Think Tech Hawaii, where we co-host Hibachi Talk, where we talk about technology and bring in all kinds of cool guests. Also, my co-host with me today is... Andrew the, Andrew, the security guy. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching Think Tech Hawaii, and thanks for watching Hibachi Talk. We also have Angus. Have you been lab? It's Angus. I bring in all kinds of wee things. Oh, look, you see my lips moving. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. I'm Tim Apicella. I'm your host for Moving Hawaii Forward. I'm here with Jay Fidel, Transportation Observer. Jay, thanks again for joining us. Let me add a point to what I was saying before, right. Tim. And that is, you know, yes, the population has increased dramatically, and the population may continue to increase. That's a big F, because if this place gets so crowded that, you know, the quality of life, you know, rockets down, uh, then people are going to leave. I think some people are leaving. I think we could have a negative uh, in migration pretty easily, because, because we got all these problems. We got problems in the environment. We got problems in transportation. We have problems in every aspect of the economy. So anyway, um, 
if, well, it if, is the tourists that we don't want to leave because they're our well, they're bread and butter if here. If they leave, the jobs go. If the jobs go, people are going to go to the mainland. I mean, a lot of people do that already. There's a huge contingent of Hawaii people, for example, in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. That's you know, that's the third city. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, my point that I like to make here is that if the population changes, if the circumstances change, if somebody decides they want to build Kapolei, whatever they, whatever it is, some developer gets a permit, whatever it is, you have to you have to conform the transportation. The transportation serves the community. Now, some would say, no, the community serves the transportation. You build it and they will come. I, I don't really agree with that. But, you know, arguably that's happened in other places. Uh, you know, that you, build a, you build a freeway and then, or you build a, a, rail, a railway and, and then there's TOD around side. This is well, they're using the rail line in Kapolei as a basis to get the permits to build. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But if, if you have changes, whatever they are, whatever the changes are, you have to conform the transportation to the changes. So if we have more people living out there, we have to have a way to do that. And all these years, we really didn't do it. We didn't do rail when we might have done it cheaper. And we didn't fix the, uh, the freeway. The freeway is pretty much the same today going out there as it was 20 years ago. You know, why don't we change that? The population has changed. The whole you know, demographic has changed. Uh, why, why don't we change the way to get there? You know, one more point, and I'll, and I'll stop. And that is transportation is the circulation system of the economy, of the, of the community. And if we can't get around, our community is, is at, 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 you know, it's, it's, it's at a disadvantage. And it, and, and it affects the economy of the community if we can't go from point A to point B. Yeah. I mean, uh, technology can only help you so much. After a while, you have to actually go from point A to point B. If you can't do that, the economy suffers and the society suffers. Well, it's the society suffers as far as um, increased stress and, and dismay about not being able to move you know, you and your family and your goods and services if you're a business. And so everything suffers, not just the economy, the mental economy, I think, uh, what suffers. I want to talk about Kaka'ako because this is this concept of, it's a planned community and it was based on densities. Oh, and planned community? Well, they, they, they. It's a plan, planned it's, community. Yeah, I'm going to use that term. I have a lot of trouble with that. Well, it's the it urban. sprung up like it's mushrooms. It's the urban community. village concept, of oh. course, what they all pine for and, and they still are. I mean, I, I had Mark Garrity from, uh, T, uh, TTS, and um, they believe that this community is going to be self-sufficient on the transportation. People aren't going to use their cars at all. That's the dream and hope. Well, I got big news for them. <coughs> Everyone's going to have a car. They have garage spaces and all those 4,000 condos that are being put online, the units, and at least they're going to have one space for one car, and they're going to be using them. So my point is this. Um, when I spoke with Mark, and again, Mark was very gracious, he was nice to come on, and he does believe in this urban village concept. But it's a slightly not quite accurate because people are still want to get out of Kaka'ako, they're still going to want to get into Kaka'ako, and I'm sorry, but Ala Moana and Nimitz are, are, are packed beyond belief. And now you put 4,000 units on that infrastructure, on that roadway, and it's just going to go from bad to worse. It's already bad, it's going to go to worse. So I asked the question, I said, well, what is the likelihood of putting in a segregated rapid transit line where you have frequencies every, every 12 minutes? You know, and it's completely not going to be intermixed with general purpose lane. Well, he didn't think that was going to be possible. That wasn't going to be part of it because in Kaka'ako, no one needs going to have use their car. They're going to walk. They're going to bike. They're going to use um, all the amenities within their urban village, and there will be no need for, for a rapid transit line along Almoana and Nimitz. I think that's wrong thinking. Some of them, <clears throat> that's probably true because they're going to be from China, they're going to be from Japan, they're going to be from Europe, and they're going to come every so often. They're not going to live here. So that's fine if you have nice shops and all that and restaurants down there. You, you can live in a little tight, tight area and take the car out on Sundays for a Sunday drive. Um, they're not part, however, of the ebb and flow of our community. They're not acting like people you know, from other parts of it. If, if the people, you know, in other parts of our community could, could move into Kaka'ako, I mean, could afford moving right. and go. spending two, three million dollars for a condo, there you, go. you know, they would do exactly what you say. They would be driving hither and yon and they would be very frustrated about not being able to get around. The other thing is um, planned community. I don't think it's planned. If it was planned, somebody were, would the say... The densities were planned. 
yeah, but if, if, if somebody would say, you know, we're going to add 20,000 or 30,000, whatever it is, condo units, then maybe don't you think we should change the street pattern? Actually change, but they didn't do that. No. The streets are exactly the same. As a matter of fact, you know, there are no traffic lights in Kakak, but the intersection of, oh, what is it, Cook Street and Oahe Street, you know, ground zero in Kaka'ako, mm -hmm. there's still no traffic light. And, you know, this courtesy thing where you stop at the stop sign and wait, you know, like, like 10 cars are waiting. And, they, and I wrote a couple of articles in the newspaper about this, but there's no traffic light there. When exactly, you know, they're going to put dollar one into traffic infrastructure. I mean, what we got here is talk. And one of the problems is this jurisdictional conflict, because you talk to, um, you know, uh, McGarrett, what's his name? Garrity? Mark. Yeah, Mark, Mark Garrity mm -hmm. uh, from the city, but, you know, that's the city. The city has the rail, I suppose. Um, but the state is the one through HCDA that controls, you know, the area. And so you want to talk about, you know, rededicating streets and, you know, modernizing the streets to conform with the growth patterns and the building permits. You know, you got one, one agency is issuing the building permits, and the other agency is doing the streets. Do right. they talk? Doesn't look like it, because mm -hmm. they should have been changing these roads five years ago, right, or before. ten. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, Kaka'ako is going to turn out to be just what we thought, a mess. Well, you, you have condos going on right now. You have the symphony. You have 400 um, Kiavi plays, I think it's called. And, you know, the collection is now online. So they're coming online right now. And your point is well made that the infrastructure is not there. Well, if you don't, you know, change the roadway and you build right up to the lot line, okay, how can you change the roadway later? It's not going to. Never. Yeah. Because as happen. I said, these condos have a useful life of hundreds of years. You can't move it. You can't take it down. You're stuck. And so I think we're stuck. The idea about building up is a good idea. Yeah. But if you're going to build up, you have to build up smart. We have not done that. And I think we're going to pay an awful price. Well, I think, you know, I think they've done what they've done. Now you have to make the best of it. And for me, what I believe is that you're going to have to dedicate a transit only. Um, I don't care if you call it a circulator or a tramway or a BRT, bus rapid transit, but you need something to get from point A to point C in 10 minute frequencies that people are going to want to get in and out of that, that part of town. Well, it's a sore point. You know, a lot of millennials take the bus. As a matter of principle, they take the bus. And they like the bus. And they hope that the bus will be ubiquitous, that you can go anywhere in the bus. And indeed, if you have a linear rail, you need to get, you know, vertical to that. You need to go up the hill, up Sierra Drive, wherever you're going. So you take it, you know, to point A, to stop A, take the bus. We need to have a really terrific bus system. Now, our bus system has been Not good. Bad. But my yeah. view is that money that could have been spent in making the bus system world class has been spent instead on rail. Yeah, it's been diverted. Yeah. Now, diverted may not be the right word because you can't, you know, you can't say diverted if it was never intended for the bus, right? But the point is, if you have so much money in the pot and you can achieve so much cash, so much spending money, then, you know, you could put it in rail, you could put it in the bus. We haven't put enough in the bus. Yeah. Well, we get down to semantics sometimes, and when you say bus, that means transit. But guess what also means transit? Rail. So in the transportation planner's world, transit means both. I agree. And that's the problem. They've got to be connected. They've got to be running at the, you know, improving themselves at the same time. And the streets have to be improving. You know, and of course, you know, we didn't talk about this yet, but, you know, the way you pave, you know, determines how long the pavement lasts. If you put a quarter inch of macadam or, you know, paving material on that street, next big rainstorm is going to start to slough off. Right. If you put the proper amount, which would be two or three or five inches, um, I shouldn't say two, more like five or six, um, then that, that's going to last a while. And what happens traditionally here is the government waits for enough complaints, and then they go out and make a big show of, you know, of, of repaving the streets. Everybody says, oh, that's good, they're repaving the streets. But they're repaving it to last for a year. This is not the way to do it. This is not the way it's done responsibly on the mainland either. All right. So, we, you know, we don't, our roads are still potholes. Have you noticed? They have. Big ones. Even though yeah. we had the outside contract that did, did a great job fixing a lot of them, we seem to be backtracking now. It's the specs, Tim. Yeah. The specs don't call for a thick repave. Yeah. Yeah. And we're gonna, as long as we repave at little tiny, you know, layers, we're going to have the problem. Yeah, my friend Suspension can agree with that. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about what ifs. What if it gets so bad? Do we go down that road where other jurisdictions are now looking at? L.A., Seattle, San Francisco, um, things that have already been 
implemented in Europe and in Singapore, and that's known as congestion, congestion pricing, which is to say, if you want to get downtown and you want to come in your vehicle, um, you're going to pay a price for that. Of course. The answer is yes. Singapore is a good example. The answer is yes. You know, you can control the traffic by economics, by charging people or not by giving them incentives that are running cash. And it's all automated in Singapore also. You know, you pass a certain point, and as a sensor reads your windshield, the sticker on your windshield, you get a bill at the end of the month. Um, that's the way we should do it here. So in, in my conclusion here, in the last minutes of your show, let me offer this thought. You know, yes, it is what it is. Yes, the growth and the building permits and the development, they are what they are. Kapolei is a second city, successful or not, is what it is. Um, the freeways, unimproved, you know, they are what they are, the, uh, and, the, and the unpaved roads are what they are, and the lack of sidewalks and bike lanes, it is what it is. But what we should focus on, and I think the city does have some talent on this, and I think maybe one of these days it will happen, is technology. There are so many ways that technology has been used in other cities to improve the congestion. In Europe, a lot. In, in England, interestingly enough, a lot. In some mainland cities, a lot. We have to use, embrace, adopt, and pay for, and use local talent to help us build it, build it, you know, in local style. We can do this if we just simply focus on the technology. Yeah. The rest will follow. You brought that up early in the conversation about intersections. Specifically, you know, they're allegedly bringing in a demo, and the cost of this demo is going to be anywhere from 27000 to $45,000 per intersection, but it's money well spent. I agree. And what is it? It's, simp it's, I don't know how simple the technology is, but it's basically going to count the cars on the side on the ancillary streets. And when they get to a certain number, they send a signal automatically to the signal light. And things are moving that way versus a timed light. It is a, it is a technology that's going to turn the light a different color based on the actual counts that are queuing that's up it. on the side streets. It's a combination. We're there. You have to have both. You have yeah. to sense the tr cross traffic. You also have to have time lights. And it's an algorithm that you and I, we sat in a room for a few hours, we could figure out. And some kid you at university, out, yeah. I, I university, <laughs> uh, you know, University of Manoa, you know, they could do that too. The problem is, right, you have legacy traffic lights all over town that are mechanical. This is what right. was explained to me a few days ago. They're, they're mechanical. And it's very hard to take this high technology, which deals in a little chip, you know, and lightning fast impulses and all that, and convert those conclusions and that controlling device to an old-fashioned mechanical light. So scrap so, the old system. Let's scrap it. You got to do that. And I take your <clears throat> point about it is worth every penny. Every penny it is worth. Yep. Let's scrap the whole thing. Well, before we uh, conclude today's show, I do want to talk about what political viability do you think it would take to have this congested pricing. Um, in Seattle, they call it hot lanes, yeah. which is to say you use the HOV lanes, but if you want to get into the CBD and use that HOV lanes, you put a little transponder on your windshield and you pay a monthly fee for that, for the right, for a single occupancy vehicle person to ride in that, um, that HOV lane. Um, that almost seems like, like elitist um, commuting, if you will. It's a no-brainer, I think. Tell me why because it controls the traffic. We don't control the traffic. We have to control it. We have to be pre pro proactive and preemptive and use, as I said, use the technology. That is one great way to do it. But if that HOV lane is meant for two, three, four people, by the way, two people in an HOV lane is probably not enough given our traffic. It probably should be bumped up to three. Yeah, you know, we're, that's we're, the way you have that's the way it started. You force that. That's the way it started and then what happened was the, um, the lanes were being unused and people were calling into the city, to the state going, why am I sitting here bumper to bumper traffic and these HOV lanes are just no one's Legitimate using them? Legitimate concern. So then they dropped it down to two. Yeah. We may be getting to the point where you have to increase it to three. And you can read the number of people in the car unless they want to duck below the seat. Well, some of them are alive and some of them are mannequins. So, you know, I'm not going to go down that road. I'm not going to go down that road. Down that road, he said. Yeah, that's, I'm not. But um, the bottom line is why would we want to convert something that's designed for HOV for three person or more and allow a single person just because that he or she may have the financial influence to pay for that sort of thing. No, we shouldn't. Okay, okay. You, you know, there has to be an algorithm that, that works for everybody. And um, it, as I say, you put me and you in a room, we'll argue it, we'll consider all the factors, um, we'll, we'll give seniority for people who are older, maybe. Uh, I don't know. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll look at the, 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 um, the age of your car. 
If you have an old rotten car, that you know that may play in it. In Singapore, you have to give up your car after a certain number of years. Right. You can't keep it, or they charge outlandish amounts. Right. So, I mean, this is a way you can you can see that we can play so many elements together to control the traffic, the drivers, um, the people using the highway, um, and it would be it would be brilliant to do that. We're not doing it just yet. Well, I don't think people are coming together, and I don't think there's enough people from different um, different levels of of experience in the community and in our institutions and in our agencies, uh, we're not getting a cross section of what what's going to work and what's not going to work. Well, I so. think people have this kind of Zen thing, you know. If God meant that we should have an easy way to drive down the highway and no traffic, then He would have solved it. But He hasn't, and so we live in this and we tolerate it. Hawaii style, we tolerate the worst things and we don't say boo about it. Yeah. The people got excited about it and someday they may because we're going to have gri gridlock coming soon, then maybe they'll say something that will become a political issue. But it isn't a political issue really. Rail is a political issue yeah. probably because of the money and the fact the newspaper stirs it up all the time to sell papers. But, but the reality is the transportation, your show, what you cover, not a political issue. And your job, Tim, is to make it a political issue, okay? Working on it, Jay. <laughs> Since you brought God into it, um, God and traffic, and that's the thought I'm going to leave you guys with today. So I want to say thank you very much for joining us. I'm Tim Apicelli here with Jay Fidel, um, traffic opinion opinionator. <laughs> and uh, thank you again for coming to this show. This is Moving Hawaii Forward. I'm Tim Apicelli. We'll see you next week.